see if we can get the source. There we go. Alright. So I gave you the definition of divine foreknowledge. I spotted this morning that I had accidentally left off a reading from the assignment sheet, so I added that in and uh, updated the assignment sheet on the portal. That's Greek. That doesn't help us, does it? And uh, that assign that will be due on the next time we meet. And it's over uh, predestination, so we we'll just. Dad wrote a sermon on foreknowledge. You read that. And he also wrote a sermon on predestination, and that's what I added. All right, so I want to give you an opportunity to ask. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's an undergraduate discussion to talk about middle knowledge and Molinism. really a, a graduate level discussion of the nature of divine foreknowledge. I have a few notes at the end of my lecture on middle knowledge. Uh, a number of prominent Wesleyan Arminians prefer a middle knowledge approach to divine foreknowledge as opposed to a simple foreknowledge approach. Among them being William Lane Craig, and my colleague Tom McCall. I haven't been I haven't seen anything about middle knowledge that has made me become an opponent to it. But neither have I um, been convinced that that's the way things have to be. All right, so I want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you have about foreknowledge or our discussion of foreknowledge. Okay, just, just ask. You don't have to wait to be recognized. Okay, are these the only references in this paper that you list under uh, prognosco, prognosis, and other New Testament terminology and full passages? Are the only ones in the New Testament that address They're all I could find. Find more, only for you. I'm not including any texts that involve prophecy. Okay, so theologically you could infer that all statements of fulfilled prophecy are reflections of confirmed foreknowledge. You could look at Revelation and say we have X set of prophecies that testify to foreknowledge. But in terms of vocabulary, I think I've got everything. Follow up question? Predestination? For ordination? Yes. Okay, to ordain means to decide something's going to happen or to appoint to an office. To foreordain means to decide something ahead of time or to appoint to an office ahead of time. Not foreknowledge, right? Has is about what God knows or perhaps 
those he's in relationship with previously, but is not the appointment of or the deciding of something. Okay, I left off last time giving you the example of Abraham Lincoln's assassination <coughs> and my foreknowledge of that from a human standpoint, ability to go back in time and predict what would happen accurately. say God is looking toward the future, you're taking a position on the question, is God in time or outside of time? Okay. You're taking the position that God is in time. If God is outside of time, then there's no forward looking at all. God sees all time simultaneously. And <clears throat> our study of physics at least seems to suggest that time is in fact a function of the material universe as it exists. Right? Time is not a constant. Time is relative to the speed of travel of the person and the observer. <clears throat> so a person going the speed of light, time would stop. So people have theorized you go faster than the speed of light, you could run it in reverse. Uh, and this is actually measurable, right? You've read, have you had enough physics to read about atomic clocks running it? the Dead Sea versus running on the top of mountains and they run at different speeds and so it's affected by gravitation and so the Bible doesn't really tell us how God is constitutionally or ontologically related to time the Bible consistently reveals to us or say it this way, God consistently chooses to use the perspective of humanity on the earth <coughs> as the framework from within which he reveals himself. Uh, you know, there, there are a few exceptions to that. Revelation, we get visions in heaven and stuff like that, but in general. Okay? Anything I said there that didn't make sense to you? Okay. So I fully admit the analogy is partial. Uh, you know, a, the philosophical way to say it is the way I've said it at the very end of the document, borrowing from William Lane Craig a proposition about a future contingent event is true if and only if the state of affairs asserted by the proposition attains. That means that I, by my choices, supply the grounds for the trueness of divine knowledge regarding my choices. But my choices do not cause God to know them. The cause of his knowledge is his nature. Uh, so. The easiest way I know to say that more simply is the truth value of a proposition is a separate 
entity from what causes the proposition to be true. So you could think of every statement as having either an on or off, true or false value, every proposition. Okay. And God, by virtue, knows whether every that proposition is true. What is it that makes that proposition true? Well, if it's a contingent event, what makes it is the decision of the contingent being. But since God foreknows or knows all actual and potential events, he therefore knows the truth value of the proposition, even though he doesn't cause it to be true. We, in fact, supply the grounds for its trueness by our choices. So, William Lane Craig's footnote here. It is I, by my freely chosen actions, who supply the truth conditions for the future contingent propositions known by God. The semantic relationship between a true proposition and the corresponding state of affairs is not only non-causal, but asymmetric. It's non-causal. Its truth value doesn't cause the event. And it's asymmetric temporally. God knows it long before it ever happens. <laughs> but it's because he knows that it will happen, though it hasn't, that the truth value, that the proposition's true. Now, I know that that... Yeah. Is that to say that something is not true until we do it? No, that's to say the opposite of that. Things are true in the mind of God because he foreknows we will do it. So, let me just give you a... Jesus will die on a cross. That's not what it is. Jesus for it to happen? And all things that God plans to happen will necessarily happen? That's the Calvinist answer. Okay. The Arminian answer is, no, it's true because God by his nature foreknows all things that will happen. And when Jesus comes back the second time, the event of the second coming will supply the grounds for the truth value. On what basis is it true? Well, it's true because it, it happens. First in the mind of God, he knows it will happen, and then in time, space, history. Another example, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Well, he wasn't really slain time, space, history before the foundation. He was slain in the mind of God 
In other words, he, God foreknew the slaying, and his foreknowledge had a truth value, had a propositional value of true because the event would really happen. Calvinist says that the reason this statement is true is because God has planned, decreed is the proper word, has decreed that Jesus will come to earth a second time. That all things that God decrees will most certainly happen. Therefore, it's his plan that makes this statement true. Why is that wrong? Well, Okay, good question. Why, why don't Arminians accept that definition? Well, <clears throat> point number one, this gets us into our predestination discussion. Uh, God denies planning some things. Two, if God, I can change the word planet to decree if I want to. If God decrees, X will happen. Then, Uh, 
more consistent kind. And Bruce Ware is a prominent Calvinist theologian today. Tom, uh, Michael Horton is another one. Uh, uh, R.C. Sproul. Both of these would, would all be uh, what I would so consider a more consistent kind. With their system? With their system, yes. They're consistent with their system. They would all believe in what I put in the notes here. It's called uh, meticulous sovereignty. I think I defined that word, didn't I, somewhere in the notes? Meticulous sovereignty believes that that God has foreordained all things that come to pass. Okay. So there is nothing in the universe that comes to pass that God has not foreordained. Now, these consistent Calvinists believe in what I've got here on the board as compatibilism. That God has created humans so that we are and they use this word, we're free to do what we want. But, here's the problem, fallen men only want to do evil. Fallen men only want to do evil. Until God regenerates them. Or he gives them grace that in some way mitigates their fallenness. And God has foreordained who gets efficacious grace, that is grace that makes them uh, desire to respond to God, and who does not get efficacious grace? And the answer is the elect. The elect get efficacious grace. The non-elect don't get efficacious grace. Yes? I know this is how but how did they believe works that is how it is? God has ordained both the means and the ends. He has ordained that you pray. Because remember, he's foreordained all things, including that you pray. And the fact that it feels like it's not ordained is, in fact, a part of the ordination itself. So that he designed it to feel free, even though it's not. Yeah. At, at which point, I mean, that's the essence of compatibilism. Now, there's hard compatibilism and soft compatibilism. That's a more graduate level, but just that's what compatibilism is, and thus. Men are held responsible for their freely chosen decisions. Even though God foreordained the conditions which would generate those freely chosen conditions in them. So that the conditions could not have been other than they were and therefore they would not freely choose other than they did. We are the creations of a sovereign God who can do anything with his creation that he wants to do. should grant that God does decree some things that most certainly will come to pass. But even an Arminian doesn't say that the truth value of the statement is a function of the decree. The certainty of the, of the statement 
is a function of the decree, not the truth value. The truth value of the statement will still be supplied by the event when it happens. So they would say that when it happens, that means no, that's what we say. That's yeah, what that's Arminian what says. Happens. Yeah. And then Calvin says both happen because of the decree. Well, I think for most Calvinists, God's foreknowledge is a function of his will. What he knows is what he decrees. And since he's decreed all things that come to pass, he knows all things that shall come to pass. And by knowing all things that shall come to pass, he knows what will not come to pass. So your options as a, so your options as a human aren't really options. Because God's already decreed what you're going to do. For a Calvinist, that's correct. But your experience as a human is one of making free choices and God has decreed that you experience life in such a way that you are in fact responsible for the freely chosen paths you take. Okay, and, so, and this is where Calvinism hits what I think is an antimony and not a paradox. Okay, and Paradox is something that appears to be contradictory, but isn't necessarily so. An antimony is something that is necessarily and inescapably contradictory. Okay, a classic example would be A is both A and non-A at the same time and in the same way. That's an antimony. It can't be A and non-A at the same time and in the same way. Right, so here's what Calvinists do with the issue of sin. So if God has foreordained all things that come to pass, he's foreordained every sin that I commit. So then how am I responsible for the sin that I commit if God has foreordained that it will come to pass? And the Calvinist says, I'm not making this up, this is, I'm just quoting the Westminster Confession, that God has foreordained all things that come to pass, yet in such a way so that he is not responsible for sin. Okay. Now, it's fine to say that, but it's incoherent. Uh, Arminians. Arminians believe <laughs> that you cannot determine that a thing will happen without being responsible for the thing to happen. Even if you use agents in the process of causing the thing to happen. So Calvin's believe that we are free beings that have been foreordained by God in all our actions. And that's where you come to think you are. No, the real the contradiction lies in the issue of responsibility, particularly for sin, because the Bible clearly says God tempts no one to evil. God cannot be tempted, neither does he tempt any man. God cannot sin. God cannot lie. God's therefore not responsible for sin in the sense of causing it to happen, doing it. But how can he not be responsible for sin if he planned it to happen? In fact, <laughs> decreed that it would happen. So in a way, I'm just trying to put together a word picture in my mind. If looking at God that way as forming all of it, being responsible for sin, it would almost be as though Calvinists were being deceived by the very God that they serve to believe that they were free and responsible for the sin choices that they made. Now, what Calvinist is going to say, God has told us in his word, Ephesians 1.11, he works all things after the counsel of his will. That's the statement that God foreordains. He, he, he works all things after the counsel of his will, including my sin. But 
He's not responsible for my sin. I'm responsible for my sin. And I'm responsible because I freely chose it. Even though the conditions of my freely choosing it were foreordained by God in such a way that I would freely choose whatever it is that I freely choose. asking them to be entirely consistent with their system. And so I sat in on a session in the psychology section of ETS talking about sin habits and addictions and how does a Calvinist respond to these issues. And what you find is a Calvinist therapist, a Calvinist theologian from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary was really annoyed by Tom McCall bringing up the doctrine of God's decrees in that context. And his reason for being annoyed is, look, the scripture doesn't say, you know, he, he specifically quotes Romans 2 where Paul says, well, if God foreordains everything, why am I responsible for lying? Okay. And uh, he says, look, the Bible clearly says we're responsible. And all the Arminians in the room said, amen. <laughs> but the Bible also teaches that God has foreordained all things. At which point the Arminian said, uh-uh. So the Calvinist calls it a paradox. They recognize that they, they don't see any way to logically reconcile genuine human responsibility with meticulous sovereignty. But since they believe the Bible teaches both, then, okay, look, we humans are finite, we humans are fallible, we just don't see how both of these things connect. But if we're going to be true to the Word, we've got to say everything the Word says. <laughs> and Arminians say amen to that too. Absolutely, we've got to believe everything the Word says. But look, you're interpreting what Ephesians 1.11 says. And you're interpreting these texts to mean God meticulously foreordains. And they don't have to mean that. And in fact, there's reasons to think that they don't mean that good reasons. So what are some, do you know some of the references for God in mind that he plans some things? Yeah, I, I know those. Um, uh, the first one is Jeremiah 19. I don't happen to know the verse. Verse 5. Okay, let's back up to verse 4. Maybe verse 3. Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to bring a calamity on the place at which the ears of everyone that hears it will tingle. Because they have forsaken me and have made this an alien place and have burned sacrifices in it to other gods that neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah had ever known. Because they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent and have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons a thing which I never commanded or spoke of, then how do you like this? Nor did it ever enter my mind. Now the Hebrew for enter my mind is go up upon my heart. But that's what it means to enter your mind. God says, I never even, I would not have conceived of such a thing as burning your children. But 
Yes. So this is a verse that teaches us that there's a distinction between God's uh, omniscience and what could be called his natural knowledge. That is, knowledge that would be natural to his nature. <clears throat> a good God would never conceive of many of the evils that have been committed in the world. Though he foreknew that they would be committed. But he foreknows them as alien to his own nature. Certainty is a psychological uh, quality. So most of you believe that God loves you. Some of you struggle with being certain about it. <laughs> uh, most people believe that God's trustworthy, and then they worry which gives evidence that they don't experience certainty about God's trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I include in this Isaiah chapter 10. Verses 5 through 7. God says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I sent it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty, to seize plunder, and to trample them down like mud in the streets. So God says, me. I'm responsible for Assyria coming against Israel. And I gave them three jobs. Capture plunder. Uh, I guess actually that's Hebrew parallelism. Two jobs. Capture plunder and trample them down like mud. Verse, verse 7. Yet it does not so intend. Nor does it plan so in its heart. God says, here's my intention, but its intention is different. Its purpose is to destroy and to cut off many nations. So you can trample somebody in the mud without destroying them. There's severe humiliation, but there's not destruction. So then God says, later on here, oops, Is the axe to boast itself over the one who chops with it? Verse 15. Is the saw to exalt itself over the one who wields it? That would be like a club wielding those who lift it, or a rod lifting him who is not wood. Therefore the Lord God of hosts will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors, and under his glory a fire will be kindled like a burning flame. So you have divine intention, which God says is separate than human intention, and that human intention, they're held responsible for and they're going to be judged for. Now, what does that mean if Calvinism's true? What that means is, I made public intention A, but my real intention was B, but I'm going to hold you responsible for B and punish you, even though I published A, you're going to be responsible for B. I see it as incoherent and and uh, unreliable. God God becomes uh, at best uh, inscrutable. That would be the Calvinist word. You can't figure him out. But inscrutability quickly blurs into unreliability and deceptiveness. So what did you say then again? Uh, sorry about version team. 
five to seven, saying, uh, divine intention compared with human intention. And then, and then verse 15. <coughs> Well, remember, you've got to, we didn't read the intervening verses, but uh, remember that uh, Sennacherib sends his Rav Shakah to say, you know, Yahweh is not any different than the gods of Hamath and Lebo and all these other places, Karkesh and Arphad and Samaria. We're going to level Yahweh just like we level every other god. And that's the axe boasting against the one who's wielding it. Yahweh is wielding the Assyrians, and they're saying they're going to take him down. You know, he's looking at the axe saying, who do you think you are? But the Calvinist says, the reason you think that you are who you are is because I've foreordained that you would freely think that way, but I'm going to hold you responsible for freely thinking that way, you wicked person, you. make a studious attempt to avoid straw men. I have no interest in destroying straw men. It's a, it's a worthless enterprise. Uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I am accurately reflecting what uh, Calvinists don't like to say it this way because it highlights the uh, logical inconsistency. And you don't find many Calvinist Old Testament scholars who write this way. In fact, John Calvin himself, who wrote a commentary on every book in the Bible except Revelation, when you read his Old Testament commentaries, sounds remarkably non-Calvinistic. Why? Well, the text doesn't lend itself to talking that way about who God is and how he interacts with people. The text seems to give <laughs> humans genuine responsibility that is not decreed. And we Arminians say, well, yeah, the text seems to do that because it is. And that's really the way it is. So. Oh, I love talking about these things. It's good mental stretching. And it's also important to be able to understand not some kind of caricature of Calvinist doctrine, but the real thing. The Calvinist would say that in their mind the antimony in Arminian theology is that God deserves all the credit for salvation and yet humans are responsible for choosing. How can a person be responsible for choosing and not deserve credit for the choice? So the Calvinist says the Bible clearly says there is no boasting before God. The Arminian says that well, I chose to respond to grace and he didn't. Obviously my choice was a better choice than his choice. In which case I can boast that I chose right. So we'll deal with that. That... Uh, in all my reading of Calvinists, that's like the that's the major shooting point right there. So we'll talk about that.